and I believe we are live. Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Frank Julka, and I'm with the Latino Commission on AIDS. Uh, welcome to Reunión Latina Day 3. Uh, so, um, quiero recordarles a todas las personas que hablan español que nosotros tenemos servicios de interpretación disponible. Uh, lo que pueden hacer si es que están viéndonos desde un computador es irse a la barra y ver en donde dice interpretation, en donde está el icono de, uh, del mundo. Y si es que se nos están uniendo por celular, pueden ir a los tres puntitos que dice more y ahí van a encontrar la interpretación. Okay, so again, as I said, my name is Frank, and uh, today in this uh, first of um, the sessions that we have, we're going to be talking about real equity, a framework for developing equitable responses in public health. Uh, so we always wonder, you know, what is health equity exactly, and how do we measure it? Well, uh, this workshop will provide participants with an overview of equity definitions and measurements in public health and discuss the relevance and importance of health equity in the Latinx communities. Um, we will close out the workshop uh, by presenting the real equity framework, a homegrown conceptual approach to developing public health responses that include equity as a salient indicator of impact. Uh, so today I am really happy uh, to be joined by uh, one of our own, uh, Dr. Gabriela Santana Betancourt. Uh, she is the Director of Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning at the Hans United Capacity Building Assistance here at the Latino Commission on AIDS. Uh, hi, Gabriela, how is everything? Hi, Frank, thank you so much. Everything is well, and I hope everyone that's joining us today is, is doing well, enjoying a nice Friday and looking forward to a, a, a lovely weekend. Awesome. <laughs> so um, without further ado, I just wanna give you the space uh, for you to introduce us to what the real equity is. Sure, sure. So thank you so much and, and, and welcome everyone. Um, as Frank mentioned, what I'm gonna be presenting to you today is called the real equity. And it's a framework for developing equitable responses in public health. I'm going to uh, just take a moment to go through the objectives for our time together today. Um, this workshop will provide you as the participants with an overview of equity de definitions and measurement in public health and discuss the relevance and importance of health equity in Latinx communities. We will close out the workshop by presenting the Real Equity Framework, a homegrown conceptual approach to developing public health responses that include equity as a salient indicator of our impact. And we will have time for a question and answer period. So first I'd like to sort of ground us in a definition of equity. And equity as a term is defined as justice according to natural law or right, and specifically freedom from bias or favoritism, according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary. So when we take equity and we think about it in terms of health equity, what exactly is it? So here I'm providing you all with a definition um, from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation or RWJF, and they provided the following definition. Health equity means that everyone has a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. This requires removing obstacles to health such as poverty, discrimination and their consequences, including powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments and healthcare. And what does this remind us of? It really is addressing the importance of addressing social and structural determinants of health in our work.
So how do we achieve health equity? Well, first we wanna make sure that we're actually aiming for health equity in our work. And health equity is achieved when every person has the opportunity, opportunity to attain his or her or their full health potential. This is how the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention define it. And no one is disadvantaged from achieving this potential because of social position or other socially determined circumstances. Health inequities are reflected in differences in length of life, quality of life, rates of disease, disability and death, severity of disease and access to treatment. So this is a, a definition and a framing from the CDC. I bring this up because often in our work as providers, whether we're direct service providers or administrators, program managers, or we work in evaluation as researchers or as activists and advocates, we may focus on really discrete health outcomes. So specific health outcomes comes for our specific field. But all of us in the fields of public health are becoming more and more aware of the importance of addressing health equity as an outcome to aim for in order for our respective works to be effective. So for example, we often uh, are now in the present time seeing this in real life when it comes to COVID-19, right? Access to testing, access to vaccination, as well as our work in the field of HIV treatment and prevention. So grounding this now a little further, why is achieving health equity important for Latinx communities, for the communities that we work with? So first, what is known? What is known is that Latinos in general suffer from disproportionately um, high burdens of childhood obesity, uh, high levels of obesity among adults, asthma and depression among children as well as adults, uh, other chronic conditions among adults, and multiple barriers to accessing healthcare related to language, cost, not having insurance and immigration status, just to name a few. We also know that immigration laws and fear of deportation have created an atmosphere that is keeping even folks that have legal documentation status here in the US from utilizing healthcare facilities. And uh, referencing a piece that was written by Gustavo Rivera and Osiris Barbo recently in City and State New York Opinion on April 8th, 2021, they cited that in specifically referencing COVID-19, Latino communities need health equity beyond COVID-19. In relation to COVID, Latinos face significant risk factors that increase rates of infection, hospitalization, and deaths. They are more likely than non-Hispanic whites to be essential workers and to live in overcrowded and multi-generational households while being less likely to have access to healthcare. These are the same issues that historically account for inequities in other health outcomes and these disparities in housing, education, and employment are compounded by lower rates of health insurance coverage, lack of paid sick leave, and other basic inequities tied to a lack of targeted health policy. The takeaway is if we are really to address the health disparities plaguing Latino communities, we need to be mindful to not confuse investments in our healthcare delivery system with comprehensive public health policy. When talking about improving disparities in communities of color, we tend to focus on improving 
the infrastructure of our public health care delivery system while neglecting public health investments that would address the underlying social drivers of health. So here again, we start to see that addressing health equity is intricate, it is complex, and it requires a multi-pronged and multi-level approach. So what does this actually look like in real life? So I'm gonna share with you a couple of different examples of different organizations that have uh, really brought this, this idea of health equity to the forefront while focusing on maybe a particular health outcome. So one is again related to coronavirus and COVID-19. And this is something from Salud America. And my apologies that this is a, a, a bit small on the screen, but what you're seeing here is Salud America's approach to sharing information related to public health. And what they really wanted to ensure was not just that the information was being disseminated, but they wanted to ensure that Latinos get an equitable share of culturally relevant information. And you can see some of the graphics that they were utilizing this was obviously in English, but they also had the same information in Spanish. And we see uh, graphic representations that are meaningful, that are reflective, as well as um, being mindful of literacy, as well as colors that may be resonating to the eye. So that's one example. A second example that I wanted to share is actually a podcast. So this is called the Centering Health Equity Podcast, and that features healthcare leaders at the forefront of advancing health. Gabriela, I believe you froze. Okay, I believe we're having some technical difficulties <laughs> on the side of Gabriela. Um, please give us a few minutes and uh, we'll be uh, fixing it. Okay, so I believe uh, Gabriela disconnected. I want to apologize uh, to our participants and please ask for uh, some patience uh, while she tries to rejoin us um, to give us the rest of this um, panel. Uh, we're currently managing this. Uh, so again, I want to ask our participants to be a little patient. I and there she is. <laughs> no, don't worry, Gabriela. I oh, was asking sorry. our participants for some patience. Uh, but there you go. <laughs> You're back. My apologies, you all. Uh, 
usually I don't have any issues with my, oops, with my, um, with my connection, but let me just give me one moment while I pull up my slides again. Um, so while I do that, I was discussing um, a, a, uh, a uh, podcast called Centering Health Equity. And just so you all know, this is something that um, information where the all the uh, sorry, I'm just trying to get this to so that you all can actually see it. Um, the references will be made available to you all. Um, Okay, so my apologies. So just to kind of keep this moving along, the particular uh, podcast, you all see the, the screen? Yeah, okay. Um, it's called Centering Health Equity. It's a podcast. It really focuses on advancing health equity in terms of population health, culturally. Uh oh, so <laughs> I believe she's having uh, problems with the connection again. Um, let me see. Again, I want to ask our participants to please uh, hold on and be a little patient. Uh, I think we all have a struggle with some technology <laughs> these past few months. So please um, wait while she um, connects again. I wanna thank participants for staying tuned. Uh, please, I just ask <laughs> for a little more patience. Thank you very much.
again, I want to apologize to our participants. I'm so sorry. She is having some uh, problems with her connection, I'm being told. So uh, yes, uh, if you could give us a few minutes, uh, we will be right back. Thank you so much. I believe she's back. <laughs> Maybe I won't talk so much about the podcast. You'll see that there is a podcast for those of you that are more interested in population health and 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 that stuff. Um, I'm afraid to share my screen because I feel like that's what makes it go crazy. But okay. So are you all seeing the PowerPoint? I'm gonna try to make it look pretty again. Yes, presenter view. Okay. All right. Um, again, my apologies. But this is part of equity actually, I'll, and I'll, I'll make it a little clearer later. Um, so this is just one final example, again, specifically looking at population health. This is like a scorecard that can be used for those of us that are um, maybe working more in like healthcare organizations, hospitals, public health departments. And it has 70 best practices that are organized into these four distinct sort of domains um, that you can utilize almost like as a checklist, as a rubric, to guide your health equity efforts. So in order for us to ensure that we're successfully achieve, so let's say that we're all on the same page, we wanna make sure that health equity is integral to the work that we do, whether it's specific to HIV, coronavirus, diabetes, obesity, what have you. We wanna make, the only way we can ensure that we're successfully achieving health equity in our efforts is by measurement. And so how do we do that? Um, so this is something that I think is still being developed uh, as far as uh, really, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's a couple of different uh, definitions even though they kind of have these core principles um, across the board. And similarly, there's more measurement uh, that's being developed related to maybe higher level organizations. So as more healthcare organizations work toward achieving equitable care for their clients, their patients, um, the recognition that there is a need for accurate and useful measurement is also coming into play. And so what I'm sharing with you is a measurement framework that focuses on equity um, that was developed by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement or IHI. And this uh, framework uh, 
was developed to help the organization understand what changes are reducing inequities and whether any of their work might actually be possibly without intention increasing disparities. And so you can read more about the pros and cons of different types of measurement approaches in the uh, recent white paper that uh, IHI put out. But just really quickly, what their checklist is sort of um, highlighting is the need to allocate resources. So where are you allocating resources to support measurement of equity? Are you collecting relevant data on sociodemographic characteristics, particularly for those groups that may be the most vulnerable to suffering from health inequity? Defining your health outcomes of interest to measure improvement over time. Um, defining your demographic characteristics of interest to examine against that health outcome of interest looking at what's called raw data in really tabular and graphical form. So a visual, uh, a visual for, for, for you all. And then calculating what's called stratified measures of disparities for different health outcomes and social indicators of interest. And really all the, what stratified means, it's a fancy way of saying that, you know, you're looking at, let's say with Latinos, a particular group as Latinos, but then within Latinos, what are the differences? Maybe differences by uh, country of origin, or maybe the differences that are relevant by immigration status, um, by race, uh, by zip code. That's what's meant by stratified. So looking across groups and within. And this is a very long checklist that was uh, developed by uh, the Prevention Institute measuring what works to achieve health equity and their metrics uh, developed in 2015. So just for the sake of time, I'm not, because we had some technical difficulties, I'm gonna keep moving forward. But just so that you know that um, really this uh, recommended health equity metric reflects social determinants of health. So structural drivers, community uh, determinants, and healthcare, all these different factors that play a key role when it comes to what drives health inequity and that we may need to work on as providers to ensure health equity. Finally, this is from the American Hospital Association. This is what they utilize uh, when it comes to uh, their work related to health equity. Um, and so they, their position is that health equi equity is core to um, the American Hospital Association's vision of a society of healthy uh, communities. And that is defined as uh, communities where all individuals reach their highest potential for health. Health equity is not the same as health equality in which everyone receives the same opportunities for health. Rather, health equity requires an interdisciplinary team-based approach to ensure everyone can achieve optimal health that is fair and just, especially those individuals who have the greatest need. Utilizing a dashboard can provide healthcare leaders with the necessary information on their journey to advance health equity, diversity, and inclusion. And at the very basic level of health equity, diversity and inclusion dashboards should include measures to include the following. And I think this is important for all of us. Race, ethnicity, and language preference in our data collection, as well as uh, stratification of that information and utilization, as well as cultural competency training, and I would say culturally responsive training, diversity and inclusion in governance and leadership, and most importantly, I would say community partnerships. 
So that is gonna be a resource that you all will also receive. It actually is a toolkit for action through AHA. Um, and to be completely transparent, my training has been in epidemiology. And so I wanted to share with you all that this is something that within the field of epidemiology, we're also starting to grapple with. Um, because one thing that we're all obsessed by in, in epidemiology is like causation and causal assumptions and causal inferences. So a definition of equity in health is really needed that can guide our measurement and accountability for the effects of public health actions. And so here's some key points uh, that we kind of take away. Um, this is how in, in epidemiology, we're starting to think of the definition. So health equity is the absence of systematic disparities in health between more and less social advantage groups. What do we mean by social advantage? That means wealth, power, and or prestige. These are attributes defining how people are grouped in social hierarchies. Health inequities put disadvantage groups at further disadvantage with respect to health, di diminishing opportunities to be healthy, and health equity in its essence is an ethical concept based on the, just, on the principle of dis, distributive justice and this is linked to human rights. So this is actually uh, from um, a, an article uh, that the authors published in 2003. And here is, so I said that epidemiologists are very, uh, obsessed with causation. And so here you see an extremely complex, at least even for me, complex uh, framework for measuring social inequities in health. And I'm gonna say this can be extremely um, overwhelming to sort of think about it, especially if, if, if you are really interested in ensuring health equity for your work. And there are some challenges. So often we think about uh, where we're getting our data from. And um, that's usually the CDC from surveillance, from our health departments, whether that's at the state, city or local level. But we also have to be mindful of that data, right? And that, that, the, that the data that we're working with may not be the best at capturing things that we would need in order to measure health equity. So public health surveillance data often lacks the geographic resolution, meaning like that geographical information for us to sufficiently describe or make statistical inferences. Again, thinking about us as epidemiologists but also as public health practitioners, we really wanna make sure that we are impacting in a way that can cause a better outcome. So about certain subpopulations and geographic areas. And that's a limitation that local health agencies have to rely on that data for describing their constituent communities, right? And so, we have to be mindful that at the local level, agencies have a limited capacity to detect and monitor the health of subpopulations that are the ones that are most affected by chronic disease compared to the general population. So again, for health equity or optimal health for all and reducing health disparities, um, we need to make sure that in order for that to be achievable, we have to advocate for uh, our local health departments to be capturing local health data that is available to us that can offer us like finer resolution um, or more granular data so that we can do our strategic planning. So what does this all mean? Um, when we're not necessarily working at the CDC, 
we're not necessarily working in a government agency. We're not at the, at the state health department. We're not at the local health department. What does this mean when we're not working in these huge sort of healthcare organizations, a hospital, but what if like me, you're working in a community-based organization and you've, your, uh, or you as an organization or you as, an, as a program, yes, you wanna make sure that you're meeting those outcomes and those deliverables that are um, required of you by your funder. It's what you wanna make sure that you're uh, ensuring for the population that you're working with, but at the same time, you also want to ensure equity. Um, so for us that are community-based providers and stakeholders working with Latinx communities, what can we do with all this information that I just shared with you all? So I'm gonna give you an example of something that we did. And when I say we, I mean in my particular program at the Latino Commission on AIDS, I work with the Hands United program and that's a capacity building assistance program. So we um, created a real equity framework and the framework really was to make sure that the services that we were providing, uh, which is technical assistance, um, was, was being done equitably. And I'll give you the context. So we as a program had quickly had to tailor and adapt the tech, technical assistance services and the delivery mechanisms that we provide uh, in the face of COVID so that we can continue offering our services. And while we historically engaged uh, the requesters of our services and the recipients of our services, including community members, providers, uh, community-based organizations, community health clinics, and health departments in person with workshops, skill building sessions, and other group activities designed to promote active learning. With the onset of COVID-19, we really had to ensure social distancing and halt all in-person activities. So we entered into this new world for us or relatively new world, which is a virtual world in order to minimize the discontinuity of services and learning opportunities for our consumers. Um, and so we began to think about what that would mean and we developed uh, and began to pilot the use of the framework to ensure that our participants and our team members as Hands United were crafting a collaborative learning approach for the utilization of new technological platforms for the technical assistance that could promote distance learning and community engagement. We recognize that not all members of our communities have access to, are knowledgeable of, or feel comfortable utilizing new technolo technologies or platforms to engage in distance learning and virtual participation in our activities. So in essence, we didn't wanna create a situation where let's say some organizations could partake, but not others because of their internet access or because of their not having a particular platform. We wanted to be mindful about that so that we weren't recreating uh, a possible further disparity. And I should note that in this funding cycle for Hands United, the, the, the program that I work for, we work specifically in the South. So that is a very particular context when we think about HIV, but also in terms of like the infrastructure of, of almost like digital disparities. I'll leave it at that. Um, we were cognizant that if we do not address those factors as possible barriers early on in this adaptation process, we could run the risk of further contributing to inequity and possible health disparities. 
as I said, not all community members are able to or have the access or it's even if it's even available or feel comfortable, confident, which is an acceptability factor to participate in program activities from which they may benefit. So we wanted to ensure that we had best practices for utilizing virtual distance platforms under COVID-19 to providing technical assistance efficiently so that our recipients would increase their capacity to effectively offer HIV testing in non-clinical settings, HIV prevention services for persons highly vulnerable to acquiring HIV, as well as integrated testing efforts. So HIV, STIs, and uh, hepatitis. And again, we really just wanted to ensure that our participants and team members were able to provide uh, continuity in our services. So we developed this homegrown framework and it's one that leverages already some resources that we had, our expertise and infrastructural capacity of our team. And our stakeholders included staff and providers from health departments, CBOs, and community health centers that were directly funded by the CDC, as well as community members. This was grounded in the understanding that equitable responses must address the lack of culturally responsive prevention and mitigation messaging, centers the importance of social determinants of health, and recognizes the roles that racism, sexism, systems of criminalization and incarceration, and societal stigma play in reducing the likelihood of optimal health and well being. And it really uh, leverages on three loci of expertise. So evaluation, action, and learning to inform three processes that guide the technical assistance res response, which is to inform and adapt, to tailor our technical assistance, and then to evaluate uh, so that we can improve upon achieved obje objectives given any newly arisen barriers presented by the pandemic. In our framework, we defined equity using the actual letters. So E is evidence-based. Are we applying an evidence base to our response? Q is quality assurance. Uh, are we, um, is quality assurance applied to our response? U is utilization. So is the response and the technical assistance we're providing, is it utilizable to the recipient? I refers to um, incidents. So is the work that we're doing specifically targeting a reduction in incidence of HIV? Uh, transmission is for the T. Does our TA response ultimately address reduction of transmission through HIV testing in non-clinical settings and our prevention? And finally, why? So if you remember back in the day in your math class, Y equals MX plus B for the slope, is there ultimately a change in the epidemic in the expected direction for communities and groups disproportionately burdened by the HIV epidemic? So not necessarily overall in the general population, but these particular specific groups that we're uh, seeing that there might not be an equitable reduction or there might be some spikes, like for instance, with young Latino MSM, men who have sex with men. Don't be freaked out by what I'm gonna show you. This is the actual framework, but really at the top row, what you have is just our three areas of expertise. And so these three areas of expertise, the evaluation, the action and the learning really um, are what's uh, sort of informing our three different processes that lead to our technical assistance response that is hoping to ensure equity. <laughs> um, I wanna make sure I give you all some time for actual questions. So 
Um, okay, so this is where I'm gonna ask you all to kind of participate with me. I really wanna know how are you working towards health equity in your work? How are you measuring progress and or indicators of success? And how are you applying tailoring programmatically to Latinx communities, to the Latino communities that you're working with? And with that, actually, I'm going to stop because I wanna hear from you all. So Frank, I don't know if you want to like have folks put things into the chat. Yes, so um, we have been encouraging folks to leave any questions they might have in the Q&A section. Uh, as of right now, uh, we do not have any questions at the moment, um, but I do want to talk to you about um, First of all, great presentation. And I do like that um, you presented um, sort of the issue, but also what you and, uh, you know, the Latino Commission have been able to do in your own way to sort of alleviate this first um, problem. And I wanted to ask you how, how have you seen the the um, real equity framework you know applied in the work have you seen any good results what, what are sort of the results that you've been able to see these past few months uh when the COVID uh, pandemic has hit so that's a great question because it's still happening so i should say that this is something that we're piloting so we have not had a chance to actually evaluate the um whether this approach has actually been effective. What I can tell you right now is anecdotally, at least for us, it's been very helpful to, how can I say, like go through a particular process with the, the communities that, so you, for my program, I have two communities. One is my primary community in the sense that it's the providers that I'm giving technical assistance to. But ultimately, this is how it's going to impact our community members that, again, specifically when it comes to HIV prevention, are they engaging in testing, testing in non-clinical settings and in, and, in, and, and you know, prevention in terms of like PrEP and other, and other uh, prevention mechanisms. So it's really helpful because um, depending on what is feasible for the health department or the healthcare organization, especially since some, which again, in the context of the South are not as well resourced. I mean, it's all relative as let's say New York City, right? And there also may be different restrictions or policies related to um, accessing care that may have to do with maybe more conservative um, being in more conservative, conservative states. So what might be feasible is not a full day, which is what we used to do, right? We used to go and have like a full day training or a, or, or a full day or a couple of days in a row in person. Maybe what's more feasible now is having um, a two hour session that's broken out over the course of many weeks. Um, we're sharing resources beforehand and afterhand for people to do kind of more, um, almost like a homework approach. Um, and so far it seems to, I mean, it's generating good outcomes in the sense that um, there seems to be an increase in learning and um, people are satisfied but I think it's too early to tell whether this is a framework that can really ensure equity just yet. Awesome, awesome. I mean, I, uh, I think, <clears throat> I think you're definitely though responding to a need of the community, like you said. You know, there are changes in policy that sort of need to be made as well. Um, but I do want to ask also how. 
Um, is there any changes that you guys are going to be making as we get back to normal or that, does that make sense? You know, like you talked about a virtual world that sort of COVID put us in. Um, and obviously this sort of has uh, forced us to be a little tech savvy <laughs> uh, or, 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 or really uh, exposed our vulnerabilities when it comes to, you know, technology. Um, so do you think that, um, how do you think it's going to look once everything starts getting back to normal? You know, I think that's a really interesting question because again, this is all kind of happening in real time, but I, I personally, do not think that there's ever going to be this back to normal, like in the sense of things are going to go back to the way that they were. I think that there's going to be moving forward a sort of virtual hybrid. So I can share with you all that many of the organizations and health departments that I've worked with have recognized that in a weird way, the onset of the pandemic kind of forced the implementation of virtual engagement and the rollout of virtual um, programming, support services, and that that actually alleviated other barriers, right? So for folks that were living in really rural areas, for folks that where uh, transportation was a real issue, um, and also where, again, kind of thinking about different contexts, although I'm not saying that that's not a context here in New York City, but it may not be as, as harsh, I guess, for lack of a better term, like feeling stigmatized by going to a particular place for services. So this kind of alleviated that. And I think that moving forward, many organizations have expressed that they would like to continue having this virtual option. But again, we want to ensure that that doesn't create a disparity of like who can, who can access the virtual option and who can't. And also think about, well, which family, which, I'm sorry, which community members actually do prefer to be in person? And so what does that mean for, for offering those services when it comes to things like um, continuing to have uh, this, you know, uh, sort of uh, personal protective equipment if necessary, uh, time for disinfection and cleaning, social distancing, you know, maybe for the near future, that's something that, you know, it's gonna have to be sort of like in, it's not like tomorrow everything's going to be fine, you know. So there's going to have to be a pro a process. Um, I, I I agree I agree with that. Um, we have a question from uh, Oscar Mondragon. Uh, he's saying many of the approaches in frameworks like this one are focused on HIV prevention. Are there differences that you have come across in contrast to programs supporting Latinx already diagnosed with the virus? So I think again, that these frameworks, it's really not, so yes, it's important to think about a particular health outcome. So, but it could, it could I think it could be easily applied to anything from diabetes to, because, or asthma, um, because it's really about figuring out what those factors are for the community groups. And remember I talked about stratification that not just across but within the group that might be most vulnerable to a disparity or to a health inequity. Um, the, the framework that I applied, I know that we also applied it to uh, the work that we did in our Latino religious leadership program, which isn't necessarily uh, focused on HIV per se as a discrete outcome. It's really about uh, educating folks so that uh, there's more awareness about HIV, but also other health uh, conditions that, that disproportionately affect Latinos, at, at least here in New York City. 
Okay, one awesome. Thing, sorry, just but just really yeah. quickly, one thing that I can share with you is that two days ago, I think it was on the radio, it was on WNYC, there was a segment on how, so this is not hasn't necessarily to do with Latinos, but how for the Islamic faith, there was the period of Ramadan where folks were fasting, right? And so people were very concerned about vaccination because they were worried about that would technically mean that 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 was somehow breaking the fast. And so faith-based leaders and other advocates of Muslim faith were 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 sharing the information and creating awareness that actually no, this this is not something that is going to go against the practice. But also providers were making sure to offer the vaccination after sundown, right? They were they so there were these different approaches being really mindful that maybe what's generally the messaging in, you know, in the community, that's fine, but that there may be really important things, really granular things that folks that might be most vulnerable need to know. Right. And I think that's also that also goes back to uh, what you mentioned at some point with um, cultural relevancy. Exactly. Um, and being I, responsive to that. Right. Like I'm going to offer these services after hours, after traditional hours. Right. I'm going to uh, uh, validate your concern and let you know, like, actually, no, this is not going to break your fast. Or, you know, if you get sick and you need water, actually, you're exempt. And you can make up that time, you know, at another at another time before Ramadan hits next year. Completely, completely. And I think that also sort of exacerbates the, the need for uh, community based organizations as well, you know, like uh, leaders coming out of their own communities to really uh, transmit the knowledge. Um, so that's <laughs> I think I think that's a, a great way of um, ending um this this webinar uh, with that message um i definitely want to thank you gabriela for uh all the information that you just provided us you know the the problem but also the solution i also want to remind our participants that all the uh materials shared today will be shared with you um and i also want to remind them that um uh, I, I want to invite people to join us again for the second round of capacity building workshops, which will, which will be happening today at 2.30. Um, any final words, Gabriela, before uh, we say goodbye to our lovely participants? Uh, no, just thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for bearing with me. So, you know, as you can <laughs> see, even in New York City, there's issues with uh, digital disparities, although honestly, exactly. <laughs> uh, on upstairs. And yes, if, if this is of interest to you and you want to learn more, here's my email. And yes, join us for our next session. Awesome. Awesome. So then again, as, as we said, thank you so much for joining us in this uh, webinar. We will be seeing you in a little bit at 2.30. And until then, goodbye. Ciao. Hasta luego. Cuídense.